My name is Michael Doherty, and I am the 2020 Real Abilities Film Festival director. And what an amazing screening that was. And this is a very new thing for all of us. Uh, so we're, 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 we're going to have a conversation about the movie in just a moment. Uh, but what I'd like to do is introduce two of the principals. We might have three at some point, but we have two with us today. Uh, writer, producer, Alice Austin and the brilliant actress who played Tracy in the movie, Lauren Lolo Spencer. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hey, Lolo. How are Hi, you? Hi, How are you? Good. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing great. Thank you. Love it. Long time no see. Lolo and I love doing these. Uh. <laughs> yeah, we do these all the time together, so it's oh. amazing. Great, great. So what I'd like to try to do, it's going to be a new thing, but I, whoever is controlling, who's, who's controlling the, the, the Wizard of Oz here, uh, can <laughs> we take everybody off mute? And I would like to try to give these two remarkable women a round of applause for the work that they've done. <sighs> That's really nice. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's really lovely. Okay, we have to put you back on mute because we're not doing audience questions for this one. It's just going to be a conversation between us um, in the interest of time. Um, but for the rest of the weekend, we will be doing uh, audience participation. So you don't have to worry. And I also want to say that on, on behalf of myself and the DOD who work to put this all together, we'd like to thank our community partners and our entertainment sponsors. They made that this basically all possible. So thank you so much. A, a lot of screenwriters would know uh, every good story starts with uh, an inciting incident. So Alice, where did this begin for you? And then at what point, Lolo, did you come on? Ah, so uh, Kirill and I had been working on a film that we've since returned to that was a very practical thing for two people in Milwaukee. It was, I think, you know, at the time, a very large budget uh, futuristic film. And we decided to, uh, to uh, do a film that we could make ourselves, that we could sort of make with our hands. And Kirill had actually driven transport when he first came to the States as a young Jewish immigrant through Jewish Family Services in Milwaukee. And then he went to NYU Film School and, you know, became a filmmaker. But he had told me stories of his experience and they were amazing. I don't think really any of those stories got into the movie. But Milwaukee is a very uh, interesting city. It's, uh, I think, the most segregated city in the country. And to us, it was like a microcosm of America. And we decided to write about Milwaukee through this lens um, and through the lens of a lot of people who live in the city. And a number of people who appear in the film actually do live in Milwaukee. So that was kind of the story of how it came about. And, um, and we found Lolo, actually, uh, through, um, I'm also a playwright, and the casting director at the Goodman Theater uh, is just a wonderful woman um, I'd worked with, and I knew they had done a play um, with a cast, uh, many of whom were deaf, and so they um, helped us get to an agent in New York who got us to Lolo's agent, and Lolo was actually the first person we talked to for the role, and the minute we talked to her, we, we knew she was right. It was kind of a miracle, because we wrote some really, uh, some characters we thought might be impossible to cast, Lolo and Dima and, you know, some of the other so, characters. So, and then Lolo, so that was, and Lolo got on quite early in the process. And so what, what was that quality that made you go, uh-huh? Uh, Lolo's just amazing. I mean, she's, I, I think, a singular presence. She's, uh, just so vibrant and um, so charismatic. Uh, you know, she just was so clearly our Tracy. There was, there was never any question there. And I should note that there was pressure uh, to cast an actor uh, who was quote unquote bankable, 
who could pretend to have a disability. And we resisted that. And um, once we met Lolo, there was no question that we would, that we would cast Lolo. We, we fought to cast Lolo, but it was, to us, it was sort of a no-brainer. <laughs> you know, that, like it wasn't, it was a fight in the industry insofar as it's, it, you know, there's always this push to cast star talent to, to uh, finance a film. But to us, Lola was so critical to the film that there was no other choice. So. And, and so, Lola, you're this fireball that sort of came out of nowhere. Uh, so what is your story? What's, what's your background and how did you get involved with the film? Um, so my background was pretty kind of regular. You know, I, I came to LA originally from Stockton, California. So I came to LA, um, went to CSUN, got my degree in TV production, um, then started working in film distribution and in marketing. And then uh, from there, I started a YouTube channel. And once I started the YouTube channel, it's called Sitting Pretty, um, all these other opportunities came my way. And as a result of that, um, is how I landed at my agency because it was kind of like, oh, all these things are happening. Like somebody should help me with this stuff. Uh, and so that's how I landed at the agency. And then uh, one day my agent called and was like, hey, there's this indie film, you know, that is specifically looking for a young black woman in a wheelchair. Would you want to audition? And I was like, well, if the shoe fits, why not? So that's, exactly what I did. Um, I never intended to act. It wasn't like a passion. I've always respected the craft because I'm a fan of film and television. So I've always respected acting. Um, and it was because I respected it so much that I thought like I would never be good enough. So it was never something that I wanted to pursue. Um, but because of the work that I had been doing on YouTube and how important it was for representation and inclusion, I was like, well, this is an amazing opportunity. You know, who knows where this may lead me? Why not just try it for the sake of trying it? And then at the end of the day, whether it becomes a big hit or not, at least my nephews will one day be able to say that auntie was in a movie. So <laughs> I was like, why not? You know, so, and, and, um, that's why I agreed to it. And then, you know, we were in pre-production uh, for like two years before we even, you know, before they called me out there to film. And so during that time, I was just kind of like trying to take acting classes right before I left. Um, and then just did my part to build the character with Alice and Kirill. And so, yeah, and now we're here. <laughs> <laughs> and what, so what was that process like between you about building the character and, and, and fitting her into the story? Well, it was uh, amazing to me. It was, it was really cool. Um, you know, luckily there were a lot of similarities in Tracy that I've experienced personally. Um, not exactly like in a van with like a <laughs> choir necessarily, but just the experience of feeling like, you know, the people we depend on are the ones always letting us down when all we're trying to do is just live an independent life. And so I really just resonated with that entirely. And so building the character with them, it was always just kind of going back and forth, these ideas and that ideas. And that was one of the reasons why I really wanted to do the film because of how open Alice and Kirill were to my notes for the sake of authenticity. It was always like, okay, let's check in. Like, is this something that would actually happen? Is this how, you know, this works and all of those things. And so it just made me really, really comfortable, especially with it being my first time acting. You know, it was, it was a great experience. And, and Alice, it, it feels like this was improvised. Like this, it, it, one of the extraordinary qualities of the movie is that it just seems to be happening. Mm -hmm. It doesn't feel like it's actually directed, which is kind of a miracle of direction. Um, so so what, what was the nature of the script? And was there a lot of improv? And um, There was, there is some uh, improv, but there was a very tight script. And um, we had left certain scenes less scripted 
for example, uh, at the Eisenhower Center, um, you, you, we knew we had to leave some latitude because it was, uh, we didn't interrupt the work at the center when we filmed. So they were still working, you know, clients there were still working as we filmed. And, you know, there were a lot of possible things that m might happen and we were anticipating that and, um, and looking forward to those kinds of things happening. Um, so, uh, but the script was, was actually, you know, it's remarkable because Kirill and I uh, had talked a lot, of course, I've talked a lot about this um, and how, you know, in, in one sense, a script is a template for a film or the film that is shot. But in many instances, the script is identical to what you see on screen. Um, and, you know, there were, there were real challenges because, of course, our Russian-speaking choir, uh, many of them don't speak a lot of English. Um, and we actually had a, a second, second AD who was interpreting for them, who <laughs> happens to be my son. And, um, and you know, there were, there were all these people brought together in reality in the film because there, we did a lot of um, street casting. So there are a lot of people from Milwaukee who have never been in a movie before, who all of a sudden, you know, find themselves on the van or in this frame with a mix of actors and non-actors. Um, but it was, you know, it was, it was, it was quite a scripted film. I mean, the, the structure of the film is all, you know, is all there. It, it, it feels like John Cassavetes in a way, in, in the way that he tightly scripted everything, but it felt like people just kind of walked off the street and, right. and just started talking. So I think that's a really, it's a tribute to the, the work that the two of you, you, you did with this. Um, and how did you Thank work you. together um, in terms of the co-writing? I can't imagine doing that. I just want I it all know. myself. <laughs> so. so we do, we do that. And um, we, you know, we brainstorm, we bounce things back and forth, we pull the computer back and forth, we exchange drafts. I mean, we have a pretty active writing process. And um, we just, you know, finished in a, that big script that we had originally started working on. And it was that, that kind of very interactive process. Um, I think, you know, we're always looking for uh, the light in something. We're looking for humor. I mean, we find humor, even if we are trying to write something very serious. In fact, we wrote this film as a drama, right? And we were in this meeting in New York. And, and, you know, someone leaned forward and said, we just love your brilliant comedy. And we were like, oh, wait a minute. I guess, I guess you know, we sort of wrote something that's funny. Um, well, that's, that's but, Dima. That's Dima, right? Is, is he carries a lot of that, it seems. Yeah. He's, um, and he is the one very trained actor. Lolo is an actor and Lolo is a natural. And um, I mean, I've, I've not worked with someone who was so on their marks every single take. I mean, Lolo's really extraordinary. Um, and Dima is, a, is an actor who, so we wrote the character of Dima as someone who had to plausibly be a fighter, right? Because that's the, the backstory of the character. And then we kind of knew that that character it would really be very helpful if it were an actor with some training because it's kind of a linchpin among all these different characters and it's a challenging role. And um, we thought, wow, we've really written ourselves into a corner with this guy too. And then a casting director Kirill's good friends with and I'm now friends with as well in Russia found him after, I mean, we searched for several years for Dima and just thought, oh, this is impossible. And uh, the guy who plays him actually went to the Moscow Arts Theater School that was founded by Stanislavski. But in, before he did that, he was a boxer who fought, what is it, 36 fights and 133 or something. He would correct me if he were here. But, um, <laughs> uh, but he's a great guy. I mean, it was, I think the miracle of the cast is that um, everyone is so uh, right for their role. Chris, who plays Victor, really took care of everybody. He drove, he drove everybody. He drove Lolo back oh, yeah. to her hotel. He drove her to the set. I mean, he's a, he's that guy actually. 
Yes. Um, and he was discovered by Jen Van Diddy, the wonderful uh, casting director who cast Uncut Gems and American Honey. And he was discovered buying a cake for the 25th anniversary of his grandfather immigrating, with whom he lived, immigrating to the United States from the former Soviet Union. So he, he's the real thing as well. So it was kind of a, a miracle of casting. And, and I think you guys all, like, I mean, there was this incredible wellspring of positive energy on set that you can, I think, feel in the film, so. For sure. Um, okay, I wanna, I wanna wait until slightly deeper water. Okay. <laughs> um, the last 15 minutes of this movie are just extraordinary. And if you, I, you li if I live in LA, and if you looked out the window, couple weeks ago that's what you were saying right um now obviously you could not have predicted that no. um but could you give some context to the the real events that were taking place um that that brought all of that on and how it relates to right now well it's it's interesting because there there were protests in milwaukee there was um a protest, a riot, people, different people called it different things um, a, a year or two before we shot the film. And in fact, interestingly, when we shot those scenes, um, we shot them not exactly in the part of the city where it had taken place, but um, in a part of the city where we needed to have security. Um, and we had police officers there running security for us who had been the police officers who, who were assigned to that event. So that was, a, that was fascinating. And we had, an, uh, we had this incredible moment of interface between Carol. <laughs> <Yeah! laughs> ah! <Hi! laughs> it's a miracle. <laughs> Wait, you're mute, you're muted. Your microphone, yeah. Well, I have this, for a moment I had this option. Mm -hmm. It says, uh, uh, stay muted or unmute. I'm thinking, should I? Should I really? <laughs> well, right, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome writer-director Kirill Miganowski. How you doing? <laughs> and I apologize. Well, I, I'm doing, I'm, I'm not doing well. I'm, I feel overwhelmingly guilty. For but you got so connected. And, uh, I, I said you were having some connection I, issues. I, I, <laughs> I can throw my mother under the bus and uh, yes, well, I did have some things to do a little bit to the end. I, uh, noble cause, I, I basically decided at the last moment to do my mother's dishes because I knew she'd be doing it for three hours and I did it in 20 minutes and uh, all of a sudden, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I had my, my phone was on and I had my alarm clock and my phone had died and I forgot about it completely. It was insane, but I'm glad I made it. It's such an honor, but honestly, you have the best ambassadors in the world. So my presence is so, uh, I'm, just, uh, I'm just an extra here. Frankly, you have the, the star of the show, the genius, Lauren Lolo Spencer, and the genius behind the movie, Alice Austin. I'm uh, humbled and uh, pleased to be, uh, to join you so very late, but also dramaturgically speaking, and it's nice, you know, to keep developing things. We have a couple of more people joining us here, you know, each five minutes, you know. Well, but, so, uh, so happy to be here, yeah. So, so, well, welcome to Real Abilities Los Angeles. It's great to have you. Um, Thank let you. Me, we, we were talking about the political stuff, but let me just put that, on pause for just a second to just backtrack a little bit. Talk like where where was the 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 kernel for you? Where was that aha moment where you were like, I got something in terms of a script, and this is how we're going to do it. Uh, if we're talking about <laughs> if we're talking about complete and total uh, suspense in the moment when aha, I think we got something, that was at the editing stage, because up until that moment. There was no time to do any aha, and there was no, we had no chances. I was sure that we, uh, I mean, it was, uh, it was uh, from moment to moment to me, it was, a, you know, I felt like, you know, I had disaster on my hands, uh, for which we had a lot of excuses, only, of course, we didn't. And uh, uh, 
uh, I had not been aware that, I, I was not aware that we had captured very particular energy. There was no time to be aware or self-aware uh, during the shoot. And I'm sure that, you know, Alice, Austin, Alice and, 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 and Lolo told you, uh, you know, a number of war stories, but the reality is we did the film for a fraction of what, of the modest amount that we needed to make it. So everything was really uh, incredibly intense because of that. And we didn't have a single moment to look back or reflect upon what had just happened. And it's so, it was, uh, Alice knows that, probably the only person who knew that actually, because I would report to Alice almost every day and say, Alice, we don't have a scene. I mean, I give up, that's it, that's done. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going, I don't know where I'm going, but I'm going somewhere. And then it was, it happened religiously with every damn scene. And then day two, mm, mm, me, mm, I don't know, something there. And day three, I think we might have something. And day four, oh my God, we, I think we have a scene. And day five, we have a scene. And then I would be so ecstatic about every scene, sort of like discovered that every scene would go on the rough cut for about five to 10 minutes. And of course, later on, it would be cut down to 30 seconds. But I remember the first time we sat down with Alice, I, I was like, I, re, I assembled something like 30 minutes long. And I said, Alice, I don't understand, but I think, you know, it's, it's something really weird. Some, we got, I think something is happening there. That's, these are exactly the words I use. Something is happening there. What do you think? And Alice, you know, we watched it together and Alice goes, you know, yeah, I think something is something there. And it was just, it's just like a feeling. It's creeping on you. And, uh, and there, you know, we, you know, it took us a little bit more time to realize that we were blessed. We were blessed uh, with very particular, very particular energy uh, in front of the camera to create it. And we were double blessed to, to, to fortunate to capture it. And that was, I think, probably of, of, you know, of all the time that we spent on the film, there was so much drama there, you know, enough for many seasons. I think that was the moment that what I thought, I think we got something uh, for myself. And, uh, and there came a point when we knew we had it. And at that point, it was just like really precious. Let's just keep it alive and make sure we get to the finish line with that one little wonderful thing uh, called Give Me Liberty. And, uh, you know, truly we were blessed. And uh, uh, another magical moment was truly at Lolo's arrival on the set. And, uh, you know, mm -hmm. we, had, we had been in, with Lolo uh, Skyping for a year and a half. Then things collapsed. We lost all our money after three years of putting delicately this project together. And then we almost lost Lolo because uh, Lolo had to go on and live her life and fight and all. And a lot of people around us kind of, you know, you know, we didn't know it would be happening. I mean, even though we didn't lose our fate and determination for a single moment. And so finally, when Lola arrived, I mean, it was just really magic. Uh, and then the following day, following day, stepping immediately into the hardest scene of all, which was the throwdown fight between Lolo and the driver, driving at like 45 miles an hour, an hour, and it's the first major scene for Lolo, I understand, like in her life, even though Lolo had uh, a lot of experience, public speaking and YouTube channel and uh, just facing the world and a lot of people, something I never had actually. Uh, and so, but it was the first major dramatic scene and Lolo nailed it. And from then on, every time Lolo would uh, appear uh, on the set, it was like, oh, thank God she's in, you know, like everybody, it really was really, uh, I think, uh, it was a total uh, catalyst. Yeah, it's like a total, yeah. you know, Lolo's presence would be a tone setter, really, for all of us. Again, it's something we were not maybe aware of at the time, but, you know, I personally say for myself, because for me it was, as, an, you know, as, as, as the editor of the thing, for me it was really melodramatic, the whole thing of editing it, because I really, I was just going kind of slowly crazy facing the material, and uh, it was really draining emotionally, while Alice was doing a lot of other work, uh, parallel to that process. So we, we stayed busy all this while, both of us and some other people, but mainly the two of us. And so for me, there would be moments of complete feeling devastated, exhausted, spent, you know, and uh, hopeless and dispirited. And all of a sudden, Lolo is in the frame. Like a few times, I think I told Lolo that, and it's like, now I can laugh at it, but at the time it just made me cry. I swear to you. You know, like te I had tears in my eyes and you had this effect on me. How dare you? Lolo, how dare you? So, and, no, but, but, but it's true, you know, it was just like cathartic, you know, you need to understand because there's 
thank God. And it's, um, it's quite, it is, I mean, you know, I'm really grateful for these moments of magic. And we had them, we were blessed. Uh, and we, we earned them, I think, you know. Uh, we didn't work for them, but we earned them just uh, because we had no choice and we had to make it. We had to deliver on the promise we made a long time ago to ourselves and to all people involved. And we had to fight, all of us. And, uh, and then there were like a few, reward, uh, you know, rewards for that. And the, those tears and those emotional emotionally suspenseful, you know, charged moments. They're all awards, you know, for that. So that was the moment that it, during the editing, I think we got something and Ellis and I were watching it. Great moment, really priceless. For everything else, there is a MasterCard, you know? <laughs> oh, well, v Viva Independent Filmmaking. I'll say that much. Um, it's, it's alive and well and living in Wisconsin. Um, so we're, we're actually kind of running out of time and I could talk to you guys for another like two or three hours. Um, but I, I want to push it just a few minutes longer because I want to ask one last question, um, which is particularly with the ending. And we were talking uh, earlier before you got on, Kirill, about the, the police violence and un unrest that was going on in, in Milwaukee and how it's relating to today. Um, what I thought of with the ending was, was Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing. And this is sort of like Wisconsin's do the right thing. Because I think that that's what the movie's truly about, is like, how do we do the right thing for other people in order to, to, to just keep the world spinning in, in, a, in a peaceful and good way? So I'm wondering, what do you think it means to do the right thing? And how does that fit into your creating art? Well, I think that for, that for me, and I think for us, the answer is pretty straightforward. It's to recognize, acknowledge, and honor our common humanity and, um, and not look at our differences so much. And, and I think that if we all started doing that, things would be an awful lot better right now uh, in many respects. Um, and I think one thing that has you know, surprised us, the film is so resonant in this moment in America. And of course, we, we didn't write it to be a political film. Um, and it did anticipate, uh, you know, a lot of things that we're seeing today. Um, we, we want people to really see the movie for so many reasons, uh, not the least of which uh, inclusion of, of people with disabilities uh, as, as people, not as like, oh, this is a token person who has X, Y, or Z, but actually these are, these are people. These are these are all individuals, and they're wonderful and interesting and fascinating. Um, Carol, do you have a Lolo? <laughs> I always have things to say even when I don't have things to say. Lolo, <laughs> <laughs> but Lolo, go ahead. You 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 want to say something? I, you know. Yeah. Well, you know, I would, you know, just kind of echo what Alice was saying. You know, it's just about seeing people for exactly who they are. Um, I think if you are a person that has um, the ability or the power per se to give other people opportunities who are either less represented or um, from a background that you may not be totally familiar with, give those people those opportunities and never shortchange the importance of authenticity. I think that's the reason why this film works as well as it does is because everyone who was casted, everyone who was part of the film was authentic to their role. There was no, someone had a fake like X, Y, and Z. Of course, as actors, there's just certain things, you know, we're acting. So not everything is true to our lives entirely, but the essence of each character I feel like every person that was casted could genuinely relate to their character and that authenticity plays well, which is, you know, the comment uh, that you said earlier about it feeling like everything was improv. Like, I remember when we did Sundance, that was like one of the main things too. Everyone was like, it feels like a documentary and all of those kinds of things. It's because Carol and Alice took their time to cast correctly. They took their time to cast authentically for a film that mattered so much to everyone. And even being on set, you could feel that energy that it was that important for this film to get done. We didn't 
No, necessarily, if it would be done, but the intention was always for the film to get done. And because everyone genuinely was rooting for each other and that no one person or whatever was higher than the other on set, everyone was equal on the playing field. Everyone had a voice. Everyone, you know, had some level of input in some way that was respected. And so I think ultimately when it comes to that, it's about giving the opportunities, respecting everyone's perspectives and really, 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 really being sure that authenticity is uh, a necessity when, when casting and especially for, you know, actors with disabilities, because that was, that's one of the things, you know, that's always kind of like the argument is like, oh, well, we're acting. It's like, why can't, I act like I have a disability and it's just like sure you can when when I can be the secretary when I can be the love interest when other people with disabilities can get the same roles as everyone else does but until then when those roles show up for us at least consider us in the casting process so um it, it's kind of like a hosh posh of all of those things. So I think it's just it's just um, important all the way around to to just be mindful of people first, and then you know the art will naturally bloom from there. Well, uh, Kira, unless you have any last words, uh, uh, you know uh, I. <laughs> Uh, I will say, I don't want to sound like a second rate preacher, so I'll sound like a third rate preacher. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, um, uh, in terms of the difference that we can make uh, and uh, in, you know, you know, in other, uh, other things, um, uh, it's, uh, I think the, the, it's really interesting because in the, mo the movie is very simple. It's about it's you know it give me liberty in a certain way. It's I think it's 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 seemingly simple. It's superficially simple. It's actually rather complex. But the story is you know it's it's can be described in a way of um, in a way of, of of saying that everyone needs needed to get somewhere. Everybody needed to to be somewhere on that particular day, and uh, they all were fighting to be there. Everybody wanted to. Everybody had a little journey. And it's you know it's a like road movie. It's a twenty-four hour road movie, and uh, in the same way we all have journeys, each one of us, and uh, these journeys are spiritual, and uh, and uh, these journeys are we 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 uh, realize ourselves, our journeys through what we do and how we do it. Uh, interestingly, if you look at everybody, everyone who was cast in 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 in, in the uh in in the film they all had journeys uh people we filmed who work at the eisenhower center they actually you know they, they work they were working people and we were filming them work we were filming them you know do do their going about their lives you know uh, um, uh, 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 uh lauren lolo spencer is the way she is because all, all her life uh you Lolo, you 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 fight, you work, you uh, you 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 do things with your hands, you create light, you know, and you you walk in your spiritual journey. And everyone, every actor, and every r real life person who was acting in this film, everyone brought something of theirs, of their journey into the into the into the film. Uh, they brought their nobility of spirit and uh, their desire to get to from point A to point B. And we were, as we were making the film, getting from point A to point B, doing the things we do the best, and which is making movies. And I think the way to uh, to uh, contribute to to the world, to the world, a world of light, today is just to continue walking our spiritual journeys and uh, to do what we do in life best, to do our work, to do our work conscientiously. And uh, I think just to continue fighting that fight, I think this is the best that we can do today. Um, uh, I don't really believe that filmmaking, it's uh, filmmaking or films can really change the world. I don't think that there is a movie that can just be made and all of a sudden, uh, 
there's this huge shift in the world towards better or towards worse. I don't think so. But I think, but it's, uh, but it's okay. I think uh, it shouldn't. I think what we should, we should accomplish what we believe in. And I think uh, these individual contributions, they will sum up toward one bigger contribution. And uh, this is the only way I think is the best way to live today. And I think that's the most important thing is to do something that we are destined to do, to walk our road uh, toward our destiny, to fight for our lives um, with the noblest of intentions and, uh, and shed light into the world, just light. Just like make people laugh, make people feel good. Um, just I think that's the only thing that we can contribute to the world is just, you know, walking our spiritual path and doing what we know how to do better than anyone else with our hands, with our smiles, with our eyes. I think that's what we need to do. Well, well thank you to the three of you for taking us on this particular spiritual journey. You made something with love and without pity. And when disability is involved, that's really hard to do. So for that, um, so thank you, Alice, Kirill, and Lolo for stopping by. And I just wanted to say finally that uh, for everybody who's on the call to tell your friends about the festival, and if you had a good time and to keep coming back for the weekend and especially for Sunday because Lolo will be returning uh, for our final event, which is Black Disabled Lives Matter. It's a panel where we're gonna try to get at what's going on in the world right now. And I already know it's gonna destroy. So um, thank you. I know it's late for some of you, uh, but have a good night and uh, thank yeah, you so best. much. Thank, Thank you, you for having us. Thank you. Bye, Thank everyone. You. Thank you.